Well, hey there, fellas. This is Mr. Hugh Halter back at you. Good morning, good evening, whenever time you're meeting. Good to see you guys. So cool to have Ryan on the team. Want to welcome him officially. Uh, so great to get other teachers, but just some good leadership. Um, takes a village to lead you guys. So this is going to be awesome having Ryan with us. And uh, so we're just going to clip right in here. This week, boys, um, just as we get started, I just want to let you know that I, uh, I decided to put my, my hand in a uh, table saw this week. I was doing a little workout back. It's been 55 years of working around different tools and table saw is one of them. I don't know if you're like me, but whenever you use a table saw, don't you always think, wow, that's a dangerous looking machine? Well, I always have. My dad trained me on how to shut off the motor after every cut, how to, you know, use the little guide to push the wood through so that you don't take your fingers off. I also had two shop teachers, uh, one in middle school, one in high school, that uh, both of them were missing fingers. So, like, I just learned that's just, like, part of the deal, so i got to be careful. But the other day, I'm out there. My daughter, Allie, was out there with me. Fortunately, her husband, Matthew the fireman, was on the other side of the house, but I was just cutting some boards, minding my own business, and uh, ran a piece of wood through and uh, turned off the motor right after the cut, like I always do, according to my father's wisdom. And the next thing you know, I hear my daughter gasp and say, Dad, there's blood all over your face. And then uh, I noticed <laughs> right then that oh, I'm like, oh, wow, there was a sound of something hitting the blade sounded like metal on metal went bank, and uh, and then all of a sudden I just wrapped up my hand, thinking, "Oh my gosh, I finally did it after 55 years." Um, now I wouldn't show this if I was running a women's ministry, and I probably wouldn't be running a women's ministry for many reasons. But they would not like to see this. But I know that you're a bunch of dudes, so I'm just going to show you. You know, it's not terrible. Took off the end of that pinky. Severed that one. I don't have much feeling in those right now, but uh, other than when I whack it on a table. But uh, remember my daughter, after she said, Dad, there's blood all over your face, she actually looked at me and she said, what were you thinking? And I was, uh, I did not go into shock. I just stared back at her while I wrapped my hand. I said, well, Al, I, uh, I wasn't thinking, no matter what, try not to run your hand over the blade of the saw, for sure. It's like... Uh, when you think back on how stuff like that happens, if any of you have ever had an accident with a power tool, it's never lack of knowledge. It's always lack of uh, timely awareness is what we call it. You're just not aware. You're not thinking it through, which is a fantastic segue into this uh, chapter four that we're in First Timothy because Paul is going to basically try to help Timothy deal with dudes that have stopped thinking. These are what we call the legalists. And legalism is literally, if you ever run into legalists or fundamentalists, um, they oftentimes take religious ideas or ideologies and then they turn them into truths. And uh, most of the time, the truths don't make any sense. And Jesus talked about uh, legalists and Pharisees and the whole thing. They're all kind of lumped into the same thing. as people that put weights on people like they, they put weight upon you almost to, to try to drown you in religious legalism or living according to perfect law is essentially what that is. And so I'm just going to read this to you. I want to actually read it out of two translations. This is chapter 4, verse 1. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times um, some will abandon the faith and follow deceptive spirits, things taught by demons. Um, good little innuendo there that whenever you run into a legalistic Christian, um, don't always just think that they're, you know, they're just, you know, unaware or they're, um, maybe they don't know. Sometimes uh, the one thing that screws up the church and its mission and its beautiful story more than anything is legalism. And so um, sometimes you just got to call it what it is. It's from the pit. Um, and in fact, if I was Satan and if I had demonic spirits all over the world, I would not probably do anything other than just try to make uh, the, the beautiful story of the gospel turn into law for people because it would actually obliterate the power of it. He's, he goes on, such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry. Um, they order them to abstain from certain foods, which 
God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. Okay, So that's the NIV. I want to read it in um, the message. It says, The Spirit makes it clear that as the time goes on, some are going to give up on the faith and chase after demonic illusions put forth by professional liars. These liars have lied so well for so long that they've lost their capacity for truth. That's awareness. That's, you've been cutting with a table saw for so long and you've never cut yourself that you just stop being aware. You stop thinking through your ideologies and uh, your religious thoughts. Um, and then they'll tell you not to get married. They'll tell you not to eat this food or that food. Um, and these are perfectly good created things um, that God has given his people. Everything God created is good and to be received with thanks. Nothing is to be sneered at or thrown out. God's word and our prayer make every item in creation holy. So I want to give you kind of a little outline on legalism versus the gospel this morning. Because um, for some of you, you grew up, I grew up in a very legalistic Christian home and uh, I couldn't wait to get away from it. Usually that's what legalism does. It, it creates lines and fences and boxes and hierarchy and... Um, rules that don't make sense in real life whereas the gospel gospel sets you free from all that so if you ever run into christians that just make you feel weight kind of weighted down with uh, their expectations of who you are supposed to be or how you're supposed to behave or what you're supposed to believe just remember that the law of christ is um, in fact it says the the old law is obsolete like it's not even useful where it used to be good to kind of, you know, show us um, that we're unable to actually be perfect. That's essentially the only good purpose for the law of Moses was to show us that we can't keep it. And so then the New Testament throughout, um, especially Paul, he would just go, look, the, this new law is it's on your heart now. It's not things written down like the Ten Commandments. Um, and that this law is a perfect law that gives freedom is what he says. Now, Paul, if you remember the story, if we go all the way back, um, chapter 1, Paul is recounting that he was the worst of sinners. And you remember, it was because he remembered his former life as a legalistic Pharisee, um, where he thought that he was on the right side, even to the point where he was persecuting and killing early Christians. That's why Paul believed that he was the worst of sinners, and that he had no ability to count himself worthy of being a part of the movement. That's why he's so thankful to Jesus for setting him free and, uh, and including him back in the game, you know. But, but Paul's real sin was uh, legalism, it was a law. It was viewing people as in or out or good or bad. Um, and then, again, heaping weight upon people and trying to root out anybody that didn't believe what he believed and so now he's trying to tell Timothy, look, don't let people be like I was, you know, because um, we're the worst type of scoundrels. We just make it almost impossible for people to find God. And so um, the law is about works. It's about thinking that our religious activity or our, the way that we do life in the world um, is better or it, it deserves God's favor. And by the way, you know, when we think about Pharisees, we always go, oh, that's the bad old legalistic guys. But Pharisees, interestingly, would have been like the best church attenders in the world. Like most pastors would want Pharisees all over the place because Pharisees, uh, they knew the scripture. They studied them intently. Uh, they were evangelistic. Uh, Jesus talked to the Pharisees as, you know, he'd say, like, you guys will travel over land and sea just to make one convert. Like, you guys are crazy at evangelism or, or conversion, making converts. And then you turn them into the same SOB that you guys are, is what he says. But he did say, like, you, you seem to be on about trying to get other people to convert. Um, Pharisees also were very fervent. They were very consistent. They never missed, you know, a synagogue or a service. Uh, they paid their tithes and their alms. They gave money to the poor. So Pharisees, you know, if you just look at the characteristics of maybe what a good Christian is, you would have to put them in that, except that they were legalists. They held everybody to the same perfection. And as Jesus called them out, he said, on the outside, you, you act and look really whitewashed, but inside you're dead. <laughs> you're just dead. 
And so the, the, that's what the law is. The law would say that you got to be circumcised. So some of, some of the stuff that Paul says are demonic were the guys that were going to brand new uh, believers and going, oh, you guys are 34. You got to get circumcised now if you really want to be a part of the real story. Imagine that that was the gospel, guys, because that was the early story. Like, imagine if, if you guys in, in CPC and the men's fraternity, you went, hey, we're going to go out and share the gospel. If you said what these guys were saying, literally, um, what you would tell them is that to really be a part of God's church, even if you're an adult male, you have to probably get five or six of your buddies to hold you down while your other buddy takes a knife made out of flint stone and he carves the end of your you know what off and besides that you can't eat bacon anymore because that was exactly what the early gospel was is you got to be a jew and so you got to be circumcised you can't eat pork you can't eat all these other things what a fantastic gospel. Wouldn't you love to just round up all your buddies and go, hey, bro, you got to hear this incredibly great news. Yeah, I know, a little circumcision, no bacon, but other than that, it's awesome. No, but this is why Paul was going, it's demonic, it's not the gospel. So uh, the law is based on works, circumcision, eating certain foods. This is why the very powerful story in Acts 10, where Peter, who's, you know, great young Peter, but Peter's still a legalist. Um, People back then thought that your spirituality was based on what you ate and what you didn't eat, therefore who you ate with and who you didn't eat. And so there are always these lists of foods that you could and couldn't eat. And so if you remember, Peter gets a dream and God says, look, you can eat this stuff now. Like nothing is unclean. That's why Paul's now reminding them and reminding Timothy, make sure that you tell everybody there is nothing unclean anymore. God, because of what he did on the cross, obliterated the law with its demands on perfection. And he basically is making everything open game. As long as you just pray over it and your conscience is good, then you can go for it. And so Acts 10 is the story of Peter and this Roman centurion eating with each other and eating different foods with each other. So um, it was also obviously about drink. It was about um, that there was only one day that was a Sabbath day. So Paul was later on going, don't let people judge you based on when you call the Sabbath the Sabbath. So if you want to gather with some guys on Wednesday morning, men's fraternity, and you want to call that uh, your church experience, that's actually, that counts. Like uh, wherever two or three are gathered, I'm going to be there. And so um, if, if you just can't get there on Sunday because you work, and so Wednesday at, at 9 a.m. is your only, that, that'll work. Um, so don't let people uh, heap all that on you. And so it was all this, it was ceremonial cleansing and avoidance of certain types of people. So all these uh, legalistic works, the gospel, guys, just as a reminder, is to set you free from all that. It's uh, relational grace. And, uh, and so uh, everything that, that now God allows us to do and to live is based on a conscience. We, we now go to the Lord and we go, hey, what, what would be good to you about me? In this situation and so there's freedom we can grow at our pace um, what God uh, asked one guy to do he may not ask another guy to do uh, one guy may go look I, I don't feel right about hitting the bottle anymore it used to be a real struggle so I'm, I'm gonna abstain where another guy can go I'm just fine to have a, a glass of red wine with my neighbors or a beer and a hot dog at the ball game um, so that's the beautiful thing about the gospel it sets men free okay so I want to go back really quick um, been thinking about as we've been going through Timothy, a couple um, thoughts that I don't know if we gave it the amount of time like um, that it deserves. One of them was when it's going over qualifications for spiritual leaders and it talks about uh, men's roles and women's roles and that type of thing. And I just remember thinking one of the one of the yokes of burden that was put on men um, and that I remember feeling early on was this idea of being the head of a home and that men should always be the head and the women is under the men and that we should be the spiritual leader. And uh, at face value, like anything in the Pharisee ingredient list, it looks good on, on the face value, but it can turn into a, a real uh, sucker for you. Um, I, I remember, you know, I was a pastor, and so I thought, well, I f for sure should be a spiritual leader in my home. And 
So I would try to sit the kids down around the dinner table and do like a family devotion. And, you know, my daughters were three and five and they just, you know, as I'm reading scripture, they would interrupt or flick a piece of meat, hit me in the side of the neck or something. And I would try to corral and then make some spiritual point. And it just never went well because they didn't behave. They weren't into it. And then I would actually get a little angry and then pretty soon one of them's crying. And then my wife would go, oh, that worked out really good. Being a great spiritual leader tonight, honey. And then we would get in a fight because I would say some things to her. And, I'd, and then we would try to do it better the next week. And it wouldn't go well. And pretty soon you just go, Pfft, you know, type of thing. I don't know if any of you have felt like that. That spiritual leadership has felt like a yoke more than a place of freedom for you. So I want to just give you a Hugh Halter's list of um, how the good news of the gospel sets us free to be spiritual leaders. And um, I'm just going to give you a couple points. Number one, take your natural spot, okay? Take your natural spot. It is natural to be a man and to, to lead. doesn't mean that women can't lead. Obviously, in many homes, there's not a man in the home. And so the woman is the head of that home, right? So take your natural spot. But the, the point of leadership, not just in the home, but in the church, anywhere, is not that you are hierarchically above somebody else and therefore you're better it's that you are like the tip of the spear you're the you're the front line that goes uh, off the u-boat first you're the one that uh, takes the first shots across the bow it's uh, it's a place of servanthood so just take your natural spot number two um, grow into spiritual leadership um, part of being a spiritual leader is not acting like you're a leader. It's actually letting people in on the story of your growth. And so, you know, early on, the, when I go off to lead some men's study or something, the kids would cry and then uh, I'd feel bad. And, you know, eventually I stopped going and doing some things with other people because either they would get mad. Sometimes my wife would even get a little sad that I was leaving and felt a little guilt that I was leaving her. But men have to grow, and it's actually okay as your kids are growing up for you to sit them down and go, hey, daddy has to go to t tonight. Daddy needs to grow. And when I'm with these men and I'm doing the, the fraternity, whatever it is, um, it's actually really good. It makes daddy better for you. And so uh, you need to stop crying now. You need to grab a book, and you need to enjoy your evening and pray for daddy because daddy is going to go grow. That's a much more natural place um, than to kowtow to your kids. One of the best things you can actually do to lead your kids is to show them that you're making commitments to grow. And so don't fear those moments where you might even have to um, kind of lay down that little law in the family is that dad needs one or two times a week where he can get away with some guys and get some time. So take your natural spot, um, grow into um, your spiritual leadership. Third, I just put down lead by following. Um, sometimes um, I've found that like just my wife knowing I'm reading scripture gives her a sense that God can lead our family like and so uh, every morning I do spend time with God I don't spend as much time as my wife so based on uh, numbers of minutes spent you could technically say wife uh, Cheryl was leading but it doesn't matter Cheryl just wants to know that her husband is actually spending time with God, be it four minutes or 14. And I just remember she made a comment one time, she, because I would always sit down in this one chair, my Bible was there, uh, my spectacles were there, um, my whiskey glass from the night before was there, all sorts of things were there, but she said, I, just, I love seeing your Bible on that table in the morning. Um, I love seeing it open, I, knowing that you've been reading. And she goes, it just brings me a lot of security to know you've been spending time with God. And so um, you don't have to run these incredible family devotion times to be a spiritual leader. Um, for your wife, even for your kids, especially as they become teenagers, if they just watch dad spend time with God on occasion, it brings such security to them, and it, and it is maybe the best way that you can lead is just to, to lead by watching you have time with God. Um, and then, you know, in regards to, like, leading family devotions and all that, um, one thing I would just say is, is ask for guidance in how you can encourage them the best. Don't just assume that they want to do a Bible study. You don't like doing Bible studies, right? So don't assume that they want you to, and don't assume they want you to preach at them for sure. 
Um, each one of your children and your spouse, not, not each one of your spouses, your spouse and each one of your children. Um, they have different ways that they grow and enjoy the Lord. Um, my daughter McKenna, growing up, she loved for me to lay on her bed with her, arm in arm. Uh, we'd cuddle, and then I would read scripture, and I'd pray. She loved that. Uh, if I could have sang, she would have loved to sing. Fortunately, I don't. Uh, my oldest daughter, Allie, she didn't like to snuggle. She never, Even at a, as a one-year-old, she didn't want to snuggle. Um, and she doesn't want me to read scripture. She doesn't want me to give her my advice. But she did want me to give her a fist pump and to pray a very quick prayer, prayer over every night. So she would text me from the basement where she lived. And um, she would go, I'm ready. And so I would walk down and I would just pray, God, I pray your blessing over Allie tonight. I pray that she would not be afraid as she sleeps and that you'd bless her day tomorrow. Amen. And then we would fist pump. And it doesn't, doesn't matter. It was just something different for each one of them. They taught me and they, they invited me into their spiritual life in unique little ways. So Maybe those are some ways that can help you as you think about spiritual leadership. It's not supposed to be a yoke. You're not supposed to suck at it. You're not supposed to get in fights around the dinner table because you try to force something upon people. Legalists force people. Uh, people that are uh, propelled by the, the gospel that gives grace and freedom more woo people into their spiritual growth. So think about that as a spiritual leader in your home. Maybe that'll help out a little bit, keep you um, from trouble. And for sure, keep your hand out of table saws. That's another trouble that you don't want. So, all right. Love you guys. Have a great week. Bye-bye.